Welcome to the February Educational Technology Advisory Council Town Hall meeting. Today we'll be talking about uh, information security and some of the things that uh, new threats that are facing us as a, as a college and, and uh, in the higher ed space in general, some of the things that we as a district are doing to protect our information resources and some of the things that end users uh, can do to help uh, keep our information and our computing resources safe. Um, uh, one quick note, uh, this is an ETAC, Information Technology Advisory Council Town Hall meeting, and just a little bit of explanation about the, about the title and the format. Our, our district uh, technology planning uh, group, ETAC, uh, met uh, this uh, fall to determine what our, our uh, 2014 and 15 agenda would look like. And one of the things that they suggested we uh, uh, concentrate on is uh, more and, and better uh, stakeholder communication to folks throughout the district. Uh, so one of the ways that we're trying to do this is by hosting a series of town hall meetings, uh, this being our, our second in the series, uh, as well as uh, hosting other kinds of roundtable discussions and other presentations to keep all of you folks up to date on the kinds of things that we're uh, planning and considering planning for technology here at both of our colleges and central services, and to get feedback from you all as to how we can uh, better prioritize decision making and planning efforts at, at the district level. Uh, so uh, we, had, we started this series uh, in the fall in December with uh, a session on the uh, telephone system upgrade that's underway. Uh, this, uh, this month, uh, the February session is uh, regarding information security. We've got three more sessions scheduled uh, for this academic year. In March, we'll be doing an update on the online education initiative. In April, we'll be doing uh, an update on the conversion to Office 365, which is a cloud-based uh, system for office applications and for uh, storing files and collaborating on files with colleagues. Uh, I think it'll bring some great functionality to the district. And then in May, we'll wrap up the academic year with a town hall meeting on how can we better coordinate technology purchasing throughout the district. So those are uh, some of the other sessions scheduled for this year and uh, hope that you'll be able to join us. We'll be recording all of these sessions and they'll be on the district YouTube channel as this one is and you can review them at your leisure or if you have friends and colleagues that weren't able to make it to one of the four scheduled sessions, two on each campus, uh, you can always refer them to the YouTube recording. So with that, let's uh, talk a little bit about um, information uh, security and why should we care about this? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, and I'll, I'll try to go through some of the most important ones, but really one of the things that I hope that you'll take away from, from this session is that information security is really everyone's responsibility. Uh, it's not just something that IT can do for us. It's not just something that, that uh, departments and the administration can do for us. It's things that we all have to participate in and all have to have some level of ownership for it. Uh, but why should we care about it? Well, uh, first and foremost, we really do need to protect the information of our students, faculty, and staff. The data that we uh, that are contained in our in our information systems throughout the district is is uh, uh, personal and private and, and usually confidential. Uh, nobody wants their personal information out on the street, and uh, because it results in in among other things things like identity theft, which are really uh, a problem for an individual to recover from. So we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to protect information from uh, criminals who would like to take it from us. And believe me, there are many throughout the world that would like to do it. They have a very specific uh, monetary motivation for doing it. There's money in stealing data and selling it. There's money in stealing data and using it to steal money. Um, so it it's, it's, needs to be a priority for all of us. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to protect the functionality of our technology resources. So if uh, a hacker decides that they're going to use our very expansive connections to the internet and our significant server farm uh, to launch other attacks on other entities like banks or governments or whomever, not only is that bad for those people being attacked, but it's bad for us too because it reduces the usability of our resources, which we depend heavily on for our day-to-day -day academic activities. So we want, to keep, we want to keep criminals out of our network and out of our servers and out of our desktops to make sure that those resources are always performing optimally. 
Uh, finally, uh, you know, we, we have a requirement by law uh, to protect uh, the information that we store uh, in our data systems, information systems throughout the district. At the federal level, we have laws like FERPA that require us to, to keep student uh, educational records uh, uh, pr uh, private and confidential. Uh, state law requires us to do that as well. And, uh, and, indeed, and state law even requires us to monitor our systems to make sure that they haven't been breached. And if they have been breached, then we have to report that uh, to uh, the affected parties. But uh, I, probably the thing that hits the home the most with people is that breaches, if we, if we were to have a breach of our, of our information security uh, uh, posture on, in the district, they're very, very expensive. They, uh, they cost a lot of money, and I'll talk a little bit further about that in a minute. So what are some of the latest threats that we're seeing? Well, we're still seeing a lot of malware and viruses and things coming into our environment. Uh, via uh, uh, email mostly is, is a big target, uh, but there's also things that, uh, that are known as a drive-by uh, 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 infections where you might go to a website that's been compromised by a criminal. It may be a perfectly legitimate website, and the owner of that website doesn't know that it's been compromised, and simply by viewing that website, you may have uh, brought in a malware or a virus uh, off of that website onto your computer, which then can spread throughout our network if it's not kept in check. Uh, the other kinds of things we're seeing coming in from the malware world are, are things like key loggers. Uh, so these are little programs that sit on your computer and watch for you to enter things like username and passwords and other kinds of critical information. And they capture that information and they report it back to whoever uh, installed it and sent it out there. So, uh, and, and again, they're, they're trying to get your credentials so they can use that to legitimately log in to one of our systems and, and compromise it in some other fashion. One of the big things that we're seeing a lot are called phishing scams. Uh, and these are emails that generally that come in uh, and they may look like um, something from ETS. Uh, you have a problem with your account. Uh, your storage capacity in your email folder is at maximum and you need to go here and do something in order for us to give you more storage. Um, they, uh, it, it might be something that looks like it's coming from your bank or coming from the IRS or any number of legitimate agencies that are being spoofed, as they say, to trick you into giving up your username and password. Uh, and so if you ever get an email that, that wants you to go someplace and enter a username and password, that's, that's pr a pretty good sign that you've hit uh, a phishing scam. Uh, one of the other things that we're seeing, particularly in higher education, and the Department of Homeland Security issued a, a, a warning on this to higher ed a couple months ago, is that um, criminals are acquiring people's uh, credentials, username and password, through phishing, and then using that to go in and convert covertly, excuse me, covertly modify data uh, that may be related to, say, direct deposit. Uh, in the payroll system, and so trying to divert your paycheck to a criminal's bank account, and uh, that's been happening all over the country. We certainly saw some of that happening here at Foothill De Anza. Uh, we have also uh, made some significant uh, security upgrades to uh, the banking sections of our HR system to make that virtually impossible to uh, to modify unless you are the actual employee that knows all the information about your current direct deposit and, and uh, and other uh, information that would only be known to you. Uh, social engineering is another thing, and we're seeing it all over the country. We're certainly seeing it here at Foothill De Anza. That is where somebody, usually by telephone, uh, pretends to be somebody they're not, like somebody from ETS, or I've even heard uh, people talk about uh, people pretending to be uh, from Microsoft. So they'll call you up and they'll say, hi, uh, this is Joe from Microsoft, or this is Joe from ETS. We've noticed there's a significant problem with your computer, and we need you to uh, go to this website and, and use, put in your username and password so we can remotely control your computer and, and fix it for you. Or we need you to go to this website and download this application onto your computer so we can, we can remotely control it and fix it. So uh, you have to be aware of, uh, make sure you know who you're talking to uh, because we're, we're seeing this more and more where people are, 
are actually using the phone to uh, uh, pretend to be somebody they're not in order to uh, steal your credentials or get you to uh, download something to your computer. Uh, one of the things that you really should keep in mind that a lot of the old ways of hacking have kind of gone by the wayside because they were actually too much work for the hackers. And what hackers are really after now, more than anything, is they want your username and password. They want you to give up your credentials because if they can get your username and password and they can use that to legitimately log into uh, uh, some server or some system, they can find their way through the maze of systems connected uh, to that to things that uh, might really matter. So you might say, well, you know, I don't really care if somebody uh, logs into my email account. What, you know, there's nothing sensitive in there. Well, there may be something sensitive in there, but, but, uh, and there probably is, but uh, more importantly, they can use that uh, to find their way to other servers uh, on the network and, and penetrate other areas where high value uh, information assets may exist. So keep that in mind. If, 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 whenever you feel like somebody's trying to get you to give up your username and password, it's probably a bad sign and you want to you wanna watch out for that. Um, what is the cost of a breach? You know, I talked a little bit more about them being significant. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what constitutes a breach cost. So there's an organization here in the U.S. called the Ponymon Institute. They do an annual report of the cost. It's called the Cost of Data Breach Report. And they've been doing this for quite a few years. And they, and they, and they do research on multiple industries. So it's not just higher ed. They do healthcare and manufacturing and, and all kinds of industries, retail, so on and so forth. And they, and they produce a report that details the cost per record to remediate a breach, and they, it's adjusted per industry. So it's pretty, pretty accurate. And so uh, they publish this on a yearly basis. So it gives us a pretty good idea of what, uh, what kind of money we might have to put out to actually remediate uh, an information security breach should we have one. So what, what are those costs? Well, there's quite a few costs related to that. Uh, certainly, uh, most states, California most importantly, has a notification law that says if you have a breach, one of the things you have to do is figure out who, who was impacted by this. So whose data did you have, your students, your employees, uh, your vendors, whomever, whose data was compromised, and then you have to notify them. You have to, and you usually have to do that in writing. Uh, a lot of times people do that both in writing and email, but you have to notify them. And there's a cost of that, especially if you're talking about having to contact millions of people. Um, generally speaking, if uh, people have their social security number and other personal information uh, uh, compromised in a breach, uh, the organization who had responsibility for that often offers uh, credit monitoring services for a year or two years, and that costs a lot of money. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it can be anywhere from a few bucks to, to 10 or $20 per person per year uh, for the affected people. So that, those, those can add up quickly. Uh, communicating with, with people impacted by the breach. Generally speaking, if, if an organization, a company, an institution has a breach, they need to set up a call center. So uh, because people get letters, get the notification, they have lots of questions. How does this affect me? What am I supposed to do? So on and so forth. Um, they're panicked. They're worried. Uh, they want answers, and they need a place to go to answer, ask questions. So usually it entails uh, employing a call center that can uh, respond to those questions via phone, via email, and then maybe channel some of those to uh, other uh, officials in the organization for, for a more specific response. Uh, in addition to that, uh, oftentimes there may be liability involved with a breach that an organization might say, uh, you know, you, you might find themselves a party to a class action lawsuit. Uh, so let's say in the case of a, a breach at Foothill De Anza, the students could get together and say, well, you guys did a lousy job of protecting all of our data, and we're going to file a class action lawsuit against you because, uh, yeah, you gave us credit monitoring services and all this stuff, but we've been damaged otherwise, and, and we need to recoup something for that. Um, and that can, be, that can be very costly. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, system upgrades, usually when a breach happens, an organization makes a significant investment in upgrading the security of their systems. They probably almost always go overboard and 
do more security than they really need to do. Uh, and it's more costly than if they had just been doing good security all along. Uh, so that could be a substantial cost uh, as part of a breach. And, and I think uh, loss of business is one that some people don't think a lot about. So uh, if, if you're a retailer like Target um, or Home Depot or whomever, uh, and, and uh, you have to report a breach of your customer's credit card information, your customers might think, you know, I don't know if I'm going to shop there any longer. I don't know if I'm going to be a, a Target customer. And if you've uh, seen the news in, in uh, the last few weeks, um, you know, Target is laying off a significant number of employees. They're shutting down uh, some of their Canadian operations. And although they don't specifically credit uh, the data breach that they had, they certainly cite that as a factor in downsizing their company and laying off uh, a, a quite a few people throughout the country. So uh, th for that, for us, that could mean a potential loss of enrollment. Uh, students might say, you know, I just don't trust those folks at Foothill De Anza. They had this breach. Uh, which we haven't, of course, had. But you know, if we if we were to have one, they might say, uh, you know, I just I don't know if I can trust them. I'm I'm going to go to another school. Um, so, what could the potential cost of a breach at Foothill De Anza be if we were to have one? Well, if you look at the the real asset that we have that criminals might want to steal are the social security records, social security number records that we have in our student information system in in Banner. And, it, and uh, the last count that I got from our uh, institutional research staff uh, was that we had almost 1.3 million Social Security numbers uh, in our ERP system. That's probably gone up by quite a few thousand uh, since I, I checked last. So clearly 1.3 million is, is a pretty solid number. If you, tr if you look at the Ponymon Institute report, uh, the cost of data reach breach report, the average cost per record for a data breach uh, to recover from that is about $145 per record. So just doing the, just doing the math there, the potential cost of a, of, a, of a widespread data breach at Foothill De Anza uh, could be uh, over $188 million. That is a whole lot of money, uh, considering that our annual budget for the entire district is about $170 million. So our potential liability could be, be more than an entire year's operating funds. Uh, so nothing trivial and definitely something to protect against. What are some of the, the recent breaches in higher ed that you may have heard of uh, that are or the ones that are impacting higher ed? Uh, one of the things that you may have heard of is that in the Maricopa District, a large community college district in Arizona, about 10 colleges, about 100, 110,000 students. Uh, they had a very significant data breach, I think, in 2013. Um, they tracked that down to careless internal practices uh, so that they had uh, uh, identified some of their security vulnerabilities and made recommendations to management about how to fix that and nobody paid attention and it just went undone. And in other areas they were using just really sloppy uh, information security techniques. Uh, all things that could have been avoided. Uh, I, when I did the research for this uh, town hall meeting, I uh, looked to see what the total cost of, of that breach has been so far. Uh, it was, uh, at least at the time I checked, it was about $26 million and counting. A lot of money that is not going to support students. They also have a federal lawsuit pending. Uh, uh, it's a class action suit against the district. Um, there weren't a lot of details available, but uh, the, the, the bits and pieces that I could find is that uh, the plaintiffs in that lawsuit may be looking for compensation in the neighborhood of $6 billion. Now that's a little bit ridiculous. I, I don't know that the Maricopa District may have $6 billion or their insurance company has $6 billion. And the state of Arizona may not even have $6 billion. But uh, that's, that's not a trivial uh, uh, suit, uh, even if it were half that or a tenth of that that would still be a giant amount of money, uh, and, and they, they might very well prevail. Uh, we heard a couple weeks ago that our, our uh, colleagues at Antelope Valley uh, College in Southern California announced that they had had a significant uh, information security breach. 
Uh, what we uh, have heard is that they uh, put their entire IT staff on administrative leave in trying to figure out exactly what happened. A couple other details that have come in is that this may have involved embezzlement of funds, uh, could have been a substantial amount uh, in the neighborhood of half a million dollars, may have been done through either through insider assistance or, the, or stealing of credentials, uh, and, but they're, they're being really... Uh, uh, close to the vet, playing very close to the vest with the details. Uh, so we don't, we don't know a lot about that. But putting your entire administrative, uh, uh, putting your entire IT staff on administrative leave is, is no small uh, undertaking, you know, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they're, they're keeping the lights on in that district with everybody on leave. Uh, so as more details come in, we'll, we'll try to share that with everybody. Probably most of you have heard about the Anthem healthcare breach, one of the most significant uh, breaches uh, in the history of information security breaches. That definitely affects our district. We have about four or 500 employees that are subscribers to the Anthem, uh, Anthem Healthcare uh, policies. Uh, a lot of us have already received email and, and, and snail mail notifications about, about the breach and, and what some of the details were, and we've all been automatically enrolled in um, uh, two years of uh, uh, credit monitoring service, so this, is, this has got to be costing them a lot of money. Uh, what we've heard from Anthem is that the breach occurred because a very high-level uh, systems administrator, database administrator, had their credentials compromised, meaning that they fell for a phishing scam or had a keylogger on their computer or something and they didn't know it. A criminal got their username and password and was able to use that uh, to log in to the system remotely uh, and to access records that this uh, administrator had legitimate access to and they were able to steal those records. Uh, the administrator, uh, system administrator at Anthem noticed this was happening and shut down uh, the query, but not before about 80 million records had already been captured. So if you believe the Ponymon Institute figures on the cost to remediate a breach of $145 a record, 80 million records could potentially cost $11.6 billion to remediate for Anthem. Uh, it might not get that high, but it could potentially. And that money's got to come from somewhere. And so as a subscriber, uh, I would imagine that uh, we may be faced with I increased rates from Anthem or increased co-payments or reduced benefits or things of that sort. Now, now don't go uh, running uh, out of the room saying Joe Moreau said our health care costs are going up because uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's potential. I mean, the money's got to come from somewhere, and they're going to have to pay that bill, and, and, it's, and it could very well come out of, come out, some portion of it could come out of our pockets. So um, definitely it get, it's expensive to have a breach. Uh, so what is ETS? What are we doing from an information security standpoint to help keep our information assets safe? Well, we've been doing quite a few things over the last a couple of years to make sure that we're as safe as we can be. Um, one of the big things that we've done is, is the network refresh. This project is almost complete. Uh, I think we have one building left on the De Anza campus and three buildings left on the Foothill campus, uh, and the, our entire network infrastructure will be modern, refreshed, uh, standards-based, uh, re in really good shape. So it should perform well, but it should also be substantially more con uh, more uh, secure. Uh, part of our upgrade is we've installed new firewalls, new intrusion detection systems, a whole variety of, of uh, systems to monitor traffic, look for suspicious activity, notify us that something bad might be going on so that we can either stop it or figure out what it is and say, oh, no, that's okay, let that go. Uh, so we, uh, we have a lot of new technology components in our network that, that are very intelligent and, and can, uh, can watch for these things with us and for us. Uh, the other thing we've done recently is gone through a number of security assessments. Uh, so we've uh, brought in some very high-level uh, security professionals uh, who are certified by International Standards Body in Security Assessment. Uh, we've looked at an overall security program. So how are we handling things from server uh, configuration policies to, excuse me, to um, uh, password policies to incident response plans, all and everything in between. 
we've gotten a very good uh, assessment and a series of recommendations from that uh, that report, and, and we're already implementing quite a few of those. Uh, we specifically brought in uh, Oracle Corporation, one of our neighbors here in Silicon Valley, who makes uh, the database that uh, sits behind uh, the banner system and, and other applications that we uh, run on campus. And we had them come in and do an in-depth database-specific uh, security assessment. And that's given us a lot of really good ideas about how we can tighten up security about, around the database and make it less vulnerable to, um, to criminals. We are getting ready to do what's called a penetration test. This is essentially where we hire uh, uh, trustworthy uh, security companies uh, to do their very best to break into our systems, to breach our systems, and see what they can find, see what they can steal, and then come back to us with a report and say, here are some of the holes you've got, here are some of the ways that we were able to get into your system, and you need to fix these. And so out of that will come a series of recommendations that we can use to, again, tighten up security around a whole variety of things, whether it's network configuration or server configuration or our uh, uh, interfaces between those uh, things or encryption or, or a whole variety of things. Um, we're also upgrading our identity management systems. Uh, we've been using um, a single sign-on for a long time, and it's been pretty good, but we're taking that to the next, next level and, and upgrading that to uh, some very good industry standard uh, systems called Shibboleth and CAS, and those uh, not only will um, enhance uh, the quality of our security, but it'll make it easier for us to integrate with other systems, say ones that are offered by the state or the federal government or what have you, so that students and faculty and staff could use their uh, local credentials to access other systems that they're, they're authorized to get to. We're also looking at exploring two-factor authentication. Uh, so this would be um, a, a system that would not just use a username and a password, but a username, a password, and some other piece of information, or perhaps a thumbprint or something else uh, besides just a password. So uh, two-factor authentication raises the security level on systems uh, substantially, and so we're, we're looking at how to do that in a way that uh, makes sense for our, our particular environment. Uh, some more things that we're doing, We've, we have put together an information security team. Uh, this is a group of people that have, uh, in some way, shape, or form, some direct responsibility for information security on the campus. So as you would imagine, it's, it's some folks from ETS, from the business office, uh, from the business office at both campuses, uh, from uh, all, over, all over the district, people that can advise us on the kinds of things that we uh, should be doing or, or particularly how we should do them in order to help our security, our information security uh, program stay top notch, but also not get in the way of the kinds of things that we need to do academically or administratively to be successful. Uh, we're implementing uh, additional security systems and policies based on the assessment and uh, assessments that I, I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, these are not policies like board policies, but policies like technical policies, like do we as a matter of course, let this programmer have access to this server, or should they go through some other way to get to that information uh, because it's less makes that less vulnerable? Or should we have a special character uh, required in our uh, username and password setup? Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And again, uh, we're uh, collaborating with our colleagues on the Educational Technology Advisory Committee on these town hall meetings to be able to um, uh, foster broader awareness from uh, all of the stakeholders throughout the district about the kinds of things that, that we all need to do to stay safe. So what can end users do? A uh, lot of things and a lot of very simple things. Uh, that should uh, help uh, keep us all safe and protect your specific uh, personal information uh, and, and not take up too much uh, time or effort to, to make those things happen. So one of the things that, uh, that, that end users can do probably more than anything is never, ever, ever share your user ID and password with anybody. Don't give it out. Don't let a student assistant use it. Don't share it with your office mate. Uh, you need to keep those things private and confidential and don't write them down and don't put them under your keyboard or put them on a sticky on your monitor. You really, those need to stay right here in your head and, and stay secure. Don't ever share them with anybody for any reason. 
Uh, beware of phishing scams. Again, this is one of the number one threats we're seeing throughout the country, but certainly we're seeing here at Foothill De Anza, we still get a lot of phishing scams come in. Now, fortunately, we have an email security appliance called Proofpoint. It catches uh, probably 90% of the phishing that comes in uh, because uh, we, the, the definitions of, uh, uh, of what a phishing email looks like are, are updated pretty frequently. We catch a lot of that, but still some of it gets past that, that, that appliance and gets into your email box. So be careful, very, very careful. Beware of phishing scams. You, you should know that a reputable organization like Foothill De Anza or uh, De Anza College or Foothill College or whomever, we will never, ever, ever ask you for your username and password via email. We just, we will never do it for any reason whatsoever. If, if there's any reason for us to ask you for that, we probably won't even do it by phone. It really would be at an in-person uh, engagement in some fashion. So if anybody ever asks you for your username and password, uh, it's probably a nefarious request, so beware of that. Uh, look out for social engineering scams, as I talked about a little bit, people that are, are uh, 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 imposters that uh, want to convince you that they're from IT or they're from the IRS or whomever. Uh, really, you should know definitively who you're speaking with by phone or in person before you give away any kind of personal information. One of the good ways to, to, to deal with that is if somebody calls up and says, hi, this is Joe from ETS, and I need this information and that information from you, and you can say, well, you know, let me, um, let me get right back to you. I'm in the middle of something, and I'll, I'll call you back in, in one minute. Then you can look up my phone number uh, on the, on the uh, global directory, call that phone number, and if it was really me that called you, then obviously I'll know it and we can have a productive conversation. But if you call me and say, hey, did you just call me and ask for this information? And I say, well, no, then it was probably a social engineering scam. Um, one of the other things you can do is use different passwords. So we all have lots of different accounts, email accounts, uh, personal email accounts, bank accounts, sh shopping accounts, you know, library accounts, you name it. And we may use uh, the same password for everything because that's easy to do. Um, you might want to be careful with that because uh, if you use the same password for lots of stuff and that password gets compromised, then you've given the criminals the keys to all of your lockers and uh, that may not be a good thing. And one of the things that criminals are getting really good at is using things like social media, like Facebook and Twitter and other kinds of things to figure out, oh, well, I got Joe's password, and I see, oh, he works here. So let me try that password on, on his My Portal account. And, oh, let me try that password on his email. Oh, and let me try that. Oh, I see that he lives in this community. He might bank with this, with this bank. Let me try his password at that bank. They're getting really clever about figuring out where else your password might work. So use different passwords for the various systems that you access. Other kinds of things that you can do is use strong passwords. We've, we've implemented a partial strong password policy here at Foothill De Anza, uh, but a strong password is one that has more than eight characters, uses both upper and lowercase uh, uh, letters, and includes numbers, at least one number, and usually includes a special character, uh, like a period or, or an exclamation point or a question mark or something like that. Uh, the, the stronger and more complex you can make your password, uh, the harder it will be for somebody to try to uh, do a brute force attack and try to guess your password. Uh, but, you know, if you make it too complex, then they're hard to remember and then people end up writing them down. Uh, so you have to be careful with, with how complicated you make it. But if you follow those rules, eight characters, upper and lower case, numbers, and a special character, you'll probably be in pretty good shape. Change your passwords frequently. Uh, we have implemented a policy here at the district where we require uh, uh, faculty and staff uh, and students to change their password uh, once a year. Uh, we're thinking about doing that a little bit more often, uh, maybe twice a year. Uh, best practices in the information security world uh, says do it every 90 days. Well, I don't know if that's practical for our environment, uh, but uh, certainly more than once a year might be, might be advised. Uh, so we're, we're uh, consulting with the technology task force uh, at both, campus, uh, both campuses and ETAC about how we might change the timing on that and, and when is the best time to do that. Um, 
but you can change your you can change your individual passwords as often as you like, and changing your passwords frequently on different systems uh, may be a good idea. Report suspicious activity immediately. If you get a weird phone call, if you see a weird email, if somebody you don't know shows up in your office and wants your username and password or personal information from you, if it just feels weird, if it just feels suspicious, please don't hesitate to report that to us. Call the, the call center, uh, call my office, let us know that something weird is going on. Uh, we'd much rather have it be a false alarm uh, than for us to not know about some uh, uh, criminal activity that's going on that we should uh, be defending against. We promise if it's nothing, we, we won't make fun of anybody and we won't uh, post your name on Facebook for, uh, for reporting a false alarm. We really take these things very seriously. The more you can tell us what's going on, the better we can help keep you safe. And the other thing I would say is follow these same practices at home. These are things not just limited to what you do here uh, for, uh, for one of our colleges or for the district. You can use these same practices at home because, uh, trust me, uh, the criminals are, are looking for uh, ways to break into your home computer just as much or even more so than they may be on your uh, work computer. So. Uh, that uh, kind of ends uh, our uh, town hall session on information security. If you've got questions or comments about this, uh, you can send them to me directly, uh, Moreau Joseph at foothilldeanza.edu or fhda.edu. I'll be happy to get back to you uh, or uh, contact any of the members of your tech task force or the uh, Educational Technology Advisory Committee. Let them know what your questions are. We'll be happy to get back to you. But thanks for watching.